Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of John 6, 67. Will ye also go away? The whole verse says, Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Let's get some context. I mean, most of us, I think, know exactly what this is talking about. But let's go up and let's check. See if there's anything new we can learn. We'll start right here. The words of eternal life. Verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And that would be what he said up here. You guys can go about, about drinking his blood and eating his flesh. They had a hard time with it. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Because Jesus was originally in heaven. He came from there. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So it's not a physical, this is where uh, Catholicism makes a mistake. They think that if you eat the cracker, it turns into Jesus' flesh in your body. And if you drink the little cup of juice, it turns into Jesus' blood in your body. It doesn't. It's nothing about that. It has nothing to do with that. He's speaking in this sense, allegorically. The flesh would be the word. The blood would be the blood of the covenant. And so for us to spiritually partake of those, that's what our salvation is. Reading this word, drinking in the Holy Spirit, the, the, the drinking in and taking partaking in this covenant. And he tells you this. He proves this right here in this verse. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The literal eating of, of the flesh, of the human flesh, does nothing for you. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So he's telling you, I'm speaking allegorically here. You have to figure out what this is referring to. But here's the problem. This is why people make this mistake. Jesus makes it blatantly clear right here in verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. That's why they can't understand it. They don't believe. These words are foolishness to them. That what Jesus said about his flesh and his blood is foolishness to people. Like that doesn't make any sense. That's horrific. That's the same reason why they get confused about the bride of Christ. Well, Jesus isn't going to marry men, women, and children. You're right. He's not. It's not a marriage like we talk about. It is something different. It is a spiritual thing. He was using allegory there. Some places he uses allegory. Some places he uses symbolism. We have to think about this from a spiritual standpoint. And when you do, you start to understand what he's talking about. Then you don't get into those kinds of very weird false doctrines. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. He, already, he knows the hearts of man. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. You and I are saved because the Father granted us that. We were presented with that. I can't have faith in Christ unless the Father gives me faith. And this goes right back to um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Verse 9 is the key. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The faith and the grace is his faith and his grace given to you. <coughs> Excuse me. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They couldn't take it. They couldn't handle it. There are some people who just will not get it because they don't have the ability to get it. We were that way too until the Father called us. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, Simon Peter gets it. Because the Father gave him the ability to understand. But he was willing to do, do so. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. But in another account, when they, this same interaction is being recorded, what did Jesus say back to Peter? Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Spirit has revealed it to you. 
amazing. Many have forsaken Christ and have walked no more with him. But what reason have you to make a change? Has there been any reason for it in the past? Has not Jesus proved himself all sufficient? A lot of people are abandoning the faith today. They probably need to hear this. He appeals to you this morning. Have I been a wilderness unto you? When your soul has simply trusted Jesus, have you ever been confounded? Have you not up till now found your Lord to be a compassionate and generous friend to you? And has not simple faith in him given you all the peace your spirit could desire? See, a lot of people to that question would say, no, oh, my life, here lately, my life has been in utter turmoil and I've been doubting and questioning. Yeah, that's not because of him, that's because of you. You're the one that doubts. If you have doubts, it's because you are the one struggling, not him. He has presented you with everything. All you have to do is read it. There's a lot of people that, that they're like, I, I feel like I should be doing more for the Lord. And they really get bent out of shape over this. What can you do for him that he can't do for himself? What can you do for him that he hasn't already done for himself? See, there's nothing we can do. It's not of our works. Our works are filthy rags. There's nothing we can do. And I've had to answer people's questions about this over the years. And I tell them, but what can you do? Well, I don't know. I just, I feel like I should be doing something. But what? What can you do that's going to have any positive effect on the Lord? Other than believing. If you're believing, you're doing everything you need to do. If you have faith, you're doing everything you need to do. That's it. But there are a lot of people who get offended and walk away because of that. Because of them. Because they just can't bring themselves to realize it's not about me. It's all about him. See, we have to understand it's not about us. And it never will be about us. Can you so much as dream of a better friend than he who has been to you? Then change not the old and tried for new and false. A lot of people are doing that. That's why the mega churches are doing so well. As for the present, can that compel you to leave Christ? When we are hard beset with this world or with the severer trials within the church, we find it a most blessed thing to pillow our head upon the bosom of our Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is the joy we have today that we are saved in him. And if this joy be satisfying, wherefore should we think of changing? Who barters gold for dross when we will not forswear the sun till we find a better light, nor leave our Lord until a brighter love shall appear? And since this can never be... Shower curtain fell down. <laughs> what a random thing to happen. Okay, let me start the sentence again. We will not forswear the sun till we find a better light, nor leave our Lord until a brighter lover shall appear. And since this can never be, since we can't ever achieve that, we will hold him with a grasp immortal and bind his name as a seal upon our arm. As for the future, can you suggest anything which can arise that shall render it necessary for you to mutiny or desert the old flag to serve under another captain? We think not. If life be long, he changes not. If we are poor, what better than to have Christ who can make us rich? When we are sick, what more do we want than Jesus to make our bed in our sickness? When we die, is it not written that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? We say with Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? I say to everyone, what does the scripture say? When you have doubts and fears, questions, troubles, turmoils, what does the scripture say? What does it tell us concerning such things? What does it tell us we should do concerning those things? Because if the scripture says it, the Lord says it.
We're going to have doubts. We're going to have struggles. We're going to have questionings. That's normal because we're human. But we make a mistake if we go to man to find the answer. Or if we use those questionings and doubts as, a, as an excuse to latch on to something that isn't him. And so, so many in these last days, in these final, final moments, are abandoning the faith and doing that very thing. Because they don't think they're able to get the right answer. Read the Bible. I heard a pastor the other day. I was watching a video. And that's and he said that in the video. Same thing. He's, he goes, the problem is Christians just aren't reading the scriptures. He said it three times. He's right. That's been the whole crux of this ministry. The core of this has been read, read, read the scriptures. This is where we falter. This is where we stumble. This is where we fall. The simplest thing Christ gave us to do is the hardest thing for people to do. Sit down and read the Bible. Well, I don't understand that. And you're never going to if you don't read it. If you sit down and you read the theory of aeronautical, the theory of uh, physics or the theory of aeronautical science or the theory of ANP, which is airframe and power plant. If you sit down and you read that, you're not going to understand a word you're saying. That's what the stuff you study for um, avionics. If you sit down and read that, you won't understand any of it. But if you have somebody starting to teach you a little bit and show you the way, then when you start to read it, it starts to catch. You start to go, oh, okay, I know what that is. If you get the opportunity to work on a helicopter or a, or a, a jet plane, I, I have. I worked on Blackhawks and Chinooks. It makes way more sense. The only way you're going to be able to learn it is if you do it. <clears throat> And so the only way we can understand the Lord and understand his word is if we're reading it. The problem is not enough of us are taking enough time to read it. Now, some of us are busy. I get it. Dedicate time to that. Set aside time for that. Close the day with scripture. Open the day with scripture. Any opportunity we can find. Keep a Bible in the bathroom. When you're in there going to the bathroom, it's a perfect opportunity to read. If you, if people aren't doing like you, like they do me, and beat on the door, trying to have a conversation through the door. But if you have that quiet time, that's perfect time. The Lord understands. He knows how the world is. But there are people because of the lack of understanding and their lack of desire to understand, which is worse, will won't go away because they won't find out what the scriptures say. What does the scripture say? That's what you do. There are people that need somebody to hold their hand through everything. They need somebody to hold them by the hand and pull them and escort them and push them and drag them because their faith is weak. They're among us. The Lord said, have patience with them. It's hard to do sometimes, but there it is. But the one thing we can never do is ever go away because we don't understand. That's on us. That's our responsibility, not his, because he made it easy. We just have to go do it. We just have to go read. We just have to go study. We just have to go learn. And the Holy Spirit will teach us. Will ye also go away? I'm not going away. I can't imagine going any, uh, any other place because nothing else and no one else can offer me what he's offered me. Acceptance. Perfect acceptance. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. I thank you that... You've opened the word up to us so that we can see some of the wonderful things hidden in the script. So that we can see some of the finer details that really spell the case out, really tell us the story, really connect the dots between other verses. And how amazing it is that the whole Bible connects with the whole Bible. And what's even more amazing is that every time somebody talks about how, well, this isn't in the Bible, that's not in the Bible, uh, or Jesus isn't in the Old Testament, and then you reveal a scripture that shows that it that's wrong, that every false doctrine is proven wrong by scripture. 
all our problems can be solved by going into the scriptures and seeing what it says, remembering and praying the promises, going back and learning over and over. And then that builds us up to be stronger, to not have those doubts, not have those fears and not have those questions because they're all dealt with. And Father, the problem is us. The problem is us. And you are willing to make us able. The problem is a lot of us just aren't willing. Well, Father, make us willing so that we you can make us able. For those of us that are willing and that you have made able, thank you, Father. Thank you that you've opened the word up to us. And it has been a beacon and a light. A cure for so many things. But for those who are weak in the faith, for those who aren't willing, Lord, make them willing so that the opportunity is there for you to make them able. That way they'll believe too, that way they won't go away, so that we don't lose any more out of our ranks. So that they're, I mean, I know there's a set number and everything's already been set up, but I would rather they come home with the rest of us than walk away. That would be bad. I don't want them to walk away. I don't want to see anybody walk away from you. But maybe some have to, because they don't really believe. Who knows? Only you know the heart, we don't. But we pray for those people who are struggling, those people who have doubts, those people who aren't willing, that your word will suddenly start to make sense to them, and that they will start to seek the answers in your word like they should, because then there will be no more questions. There will be no more doubts. There will be no more being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because we'll know your doctrine, your way from your perspective. And so when they bring their false heresies, their lies, trying to convince us and sway us and guilt us and shame us to believe it like them, we can tell them, no, thank you, because I know the truth. And the truth is right in front of me in this book. I can read it for myself. I can comprehend what I read. I can think for myself. I'm an adult. One of the things that I noticed just in my older years here is that a great many people look down upon you and think you don't have the ability to think for yourself and that it is their duty to think for you. And the, one of the most powerful things I have ever responded with when that happens is, and they're doing that, now that I can recognize it is, I'm an adult, I can make my own decisions. Thank you for your concern and care, but I got this under control. And then put them back in their place. And so that they don't have that power. They don't have that authority. And they hate me for it. They hate me because I'm an adult. I make my own decisions. The, the, the elders in my life think that they have to think for me. Well, that's incorrect. Funny enough, in my short 52 years, I've gained more experience than the elders in my life. Because I've done more and been more places. Seen more. And I believe that has actually been part of the catalyst to change my perspective on things, Lord, because I was always that naive individual that everybody felt like they had to tell me how I should do things. And I've went along with it, but now I realize different. You've opened my eyes, opened my heart, opened my ears, opened my mind and opened this word. And that's the most amazing thing is, is when this word was opened, it, it exposed so many things. I thank you, Father. I thank you that you have answered the questions. I thank you that you've you've squelched the doubts. I thank you that you have answered everything and responded to everything and, and sealed everything so that there is no variation, there is no mistake, there is no doubt. It's one way and one way only, your way. And we can read your word and the Holy Spirit will teach us your way. Father, continue to teach us your way that we may, we may walk in them. Teach us your ways that we may walk in them. And be that salt and light the world needs to see. And be an example. We love you, Father. And we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. I've got a whole lifetime of experiences of what exactly is going on here and what we're talking about. And I have personal insights into this, that I've witnessed stuff like this happening. And it is amazing. It is amazing to see that the last almost five years has just been astounding.
because it has caused me to see things in a much different light. It's caused me to act in a different way. It's caused me to, to pull away from and stand up against the manipulations and, uh, and stuff like that in my life. And they hate it. And every time that stuff happens, it causes me to go even closer to him. It causes me to grab a hold more of him. It causes me to hang on more of him because the answers are here. And so all I have to do is go and accept the answers. What are the answers to my questions, my issues, my trials, my troubles? They're right here in the word. All I have to do is turn back to it and follow it. Now, as a side note, one of the scary things I'm seeing today is that a lot of people are latching onto this King James only um, way of thinking. I like the King James. There's stuff in the King James that is impossible to understand because of the way it's worded. We don't speak that way now. Oh, but that's, that's the most relevant version, okay? Well, it has problems too. And now we got people that are going, okay, if you have a 1611, you don't have a 1611 King James unless it's got the Apocrypha in it. So now there's a whole new cult coming up about the, you got to have the one with the Apocrypha. Okay, the Apocrypha is a canon. So everybody needs to understand the Apocrypha is not canon. And it was never meant to be included in the canon. Somebody out there in the past made a mistake when they did that. They didn't know better. It was corrected. Those books don't need to be in there. Those books are not going to benefit you if you read them in addition to reading this. It's just going to give you some other details and insights that really don't make that much of a case anyway because I don't know anybody who's ever been able to calculate more what this Bible is saying when they use the Apocrypha as a reference. We just use the scriptures that are already in the Bible as a reference. Now, in, con in conjunction with the King James, the King James... It's a great translation. It's the most notable one that we have. It was very diligently done. But the one couple of them before that, I believe it was Tyndale. Tyndale or Wycliffe. Uh, I forget the guy's name. He was a singular individual that translated the first complete collection of the Bible. Much of it he did on, while riding a horse because he was trying to run for his life because the, the powers that be were trying to kill him many of them Catholic, because you can't do that. Only we are allowed to do that. I said, no, I'm going to do that. And he did it by himself. Very accurate translation, because you can take the original scripts that we have, that's how he did it, and you can go and compare them. And you can see that they're right on the money. Problem is, nobody speaks in the Queen's English anymore. When all these people come up with, I have a word from the Lord, and they start spouting this stuff off in the Queen's English. Jesus Christ does not speak in the Queen's English. That was the people of the time that spoke that. It's very ignorant to think that. And yet they do. They still go out there and run their mouth off. And... The New King James was translated from the King James and compared to the original texts. We have them. They're eat you can go out and buy them. You can go out and you can buy that stuff. We have many thousands of teachers around the world who are experts in languages that can tell you and compare it's exactly a match. We have script going back 4,500 years. Uh, the most notable one was just here last year, year before, they found a, a piece of the page of Exodus, Exodus 12. And it's a perfect match to what we have today. So unless you're getting into stuff like uh, the book that Jehovah's Witnesses wrote, the book the Mormons wrote, um, some of the stuff the Catholics have come out with, unless you're getting into that, you're pretty much okay on every version that you go and get. Do your research and you'll figure it out. Find one that's easy to read. I use the ESV. It's got some stuff missing, but it doesn't change the story. And I use the New King James. Don't let those people shame you or guilt you. And make you think there's something wrong. And then you get a Bible you don't even understand. I mean, the first time I read it, I couldn't understand half of what I was reading. Because it didn't make sense. I had to actually go look this stuff up to find out what it meant. So that when I understood the definition, then I knew what the King James was talking about. I like the King James, but I don't think it's a good teaching tool. 
So I go and I use whatever I can use that makes it easy. Currently, New King James Version. Yet I still have people that will come and will try to chastise me for that. I don't care what you think. Because if I can still get the same message across, that dog, if I can still get the same message across, there's no, there's no difference. There's no issue. So don't let people do that to you. Find a Bible you can understand. Now, my one recommendation is I wouldn't mess with any NIV version, New International Version, that's past 1986. A different company got the hold of that and started doing some weird stuff with those translations. Now, that, that version I would avoid completely. But to me, the easiest one is the New King James. The New King James and the ESV, but I like the New King James better. Works just fine. Everything's everything's the same and uh, just easier to understand. That's just my recommendation. But always remember one thing. No matter what Bible version you're using, the Holy Spirit will teach you regardless. The Holy Spirit will teach you regardless. And as another little tidbit there as we close... More false doctrine has come from people reading the King James than the, any other version other than the NIV and the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormon and the Catholics. More false doctrine has been invented by that. When you take those same verses that they use to create their false doctrine and you compare them with, let's say, from King James to New King James, and you look at it and you go, okay, you completely messed that up because the New King James same verse from the King James, is exactly the same. It's just the wording is a little bit different in order to make it easier to understand that these and the thousands of therefores have been removed and replaced with words we use today. But they use that as as an excuse and, and to skew it a little bit so that they can make a false doctrine out of it. So I love the King James, but it's easier to teach from the New King James. If you can understand the King James, if you have no problems with it, go for it. But if you want a better version, try the new King James. It's what I use. It's simple. It's easy. A lot of people say, you, you don't like the King James. I have nine King James Bibles of various sizes and ages. I even have my grandmother's King James, my, or my great-grandmother's King James from the 50s. I have one New King James. So I have no problem with the King James. I just don't teach from it because it's too hard to understand. It's too hard to, to, to get the proper understanding from that and to spell it out properly without having to explain what the words mean first and then explain what the verse means. We have a Bible that reads in our language that we speak today. So why not use it? So get it, guys. Get a Bible and read it. Don't worry about the King James. Get a new King James. It's easier to read. Read it. Better yet, get one that has a concordance in it and look up the, the original language. The Bible apps are free. So you can, you can learn too. The Holy Spirit will lead you through this and teach you. And it is an incredible journey because you'll start to unlearn all the things that the world has taught you and learn the things Christ is teaching us. It changes your stance. It changes your understanding. It changes... it. It, grow, it grows your faith. It grew mine. And then when the yahoos come out of the woodwork and say, oh, by the way, no, no, no. What does the scripture say? And I get them every time when they go, well, look what Jesus 2, 8, and 9 says. Yeah, what about 10, 11, 12? John 3, 16, John 3, 16. Also 17, 18, 19, and 20. But what does that mean? Go read it. Greater context. See, the problem isn't the version of the Bible people's using. The pro problem is context. They don't, they don't get the context. Read in context. And this is for everybody that's new here. If you're still watching the video at this point, <coughs> somebody gives you a verse, read five above and five below. As best you can, minimum. Five above, five below. Get the greater context of the verse, and then you understand better what, he, what he's talking about. 
So, because people out there take these things out of context and create a doctrine from them. I've seen them, witnessed them, use half a verse and create an entire doctrine on it. Satan does that. That's Satan's MO because he did that to Jesus when he was uh, trying to quote scripture to him. He quoted from Psalms and he quoted half a verse. If he had quoted the rest of the verse, it would have changed what he was trying to do. So when they do that, it's satanic. Concerning the little gibberish tongues thing with the, their little prayer language and everything, yeah, they take half a verse out of context in order to prove that. So when you know the scriptures, when you learn them, you learn to identify those things. And you start to see it before it comes and then they, they don't catch you in that. Then you don't get caught up in their false doctrine. And then you realize just how many people really are on the wrong page and how many really are on the right page. All right, guys, I'm going to close it there. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I'll see you in the next video.